Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. And the next voice you hear is that of an innocent man getting advice from his mother right before going to prison for a crime he did not commit. Before she passed away, she told me, um, I know things look bleak right now, um, but you got to promise me that you will not let these people make you a prisoner. You're not a prisoner. You've been captured. You're not a prisoner. Uh, You didn't commit a crime. And I need you to be Ricky Jackson when you get out. Only better. That is Ricky Jackson. You know, we get a lot of famous and quote unquote important people who speak at the John Adams. But seldom do we get guests who are more earnest, heartfelt and impactful than our next two guests. Mark Godsey is director of the Innocence Project in Ohio and author of the book Blind Injustice. The Innocence Project is a nationwide organization which exonerates the wrongly convicted and works to reform the criminal justice system. Many of the people they help are even on death row. And that brings us to our second guest, Ricky Jackson. Ricky was sentenced first to death which was commuted to 39 years in prison. And this was based on the false, coerced testimony of a 12-year-old boy. This is the longest wrongful imprisonment in U.S. history. Last June 2022, Mark told our Amsterdam audience just how DNA evidence proved Ricky's innocence. And then Ricky took to the stage to talk about his journey from imprisonment to freedom and the extraordinary power of forgiveness. So... From the Innocence Project Ohio, here's Mark Godsey. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's uh, such a thrill to be able to be in this venue, in this beautiful city with these beautiful people and share our story. But um, it's a thrill for me, but more importantly, it's a thrill for Ricky. Um, and you know, when you see his story and what he's gone through and to now be here and to be able to amplify his voice and tell his story like this, we're very grateful to the John Adams Institute for allowing that to happen and giving him this voice. So I'm going to start off with a brief introduction of just what the Innocence Project is, and then I'm going to get into Ricky's story. So the Innocence Movement in the U.S. started in the mid-90s. Before that, we believed in the US there were no wrongful convictions. And as long as there have been prisons anywhere in the world, the phenomenon of a prisoner saying, I didn't do this, I'm innocent, I'm in prison for something I didn't do, has always existed. And in the US, they would file these habeas petitions to the court and say, I'm innocent. And we had cases go all the way to the US Supreme Court, where even the US Supreme Court said this idea that someone in prison is innocent with all the safeguards we have, with all the constitutional rights, is a myth. But then in the mid-90s, something happened. We were given this great gift of DNA testing, all right? And DNA testing was in many ways like a crystal ball because we could look into it and we could go back in time and it allowed us to see what really happened with absolute scientific certainty. And what it revealed was that a lot of these people in prison claiming they were innocent and yelling and screaming actually were innocent. And when you have a system that for decades has thought it was perfect and flawless, and all of a sudden you're seeing innocent people on death row um, being proven completely innocent, it's a shock. Um, This started in the mid nineties with the first Innocence Project in New York. And as you can imagine, it got a lot of attention and Innocence Projects started spreading around the United States. And they're all based on the same basic model which is law professors supervising law students. And the law students are the ones who are rolling up their sleeves and reinvestigating the cases and talking to witnesses and beating on doors and trying to figure out if these claims of innocence are actually true or not. We founded our Innocence Project in the state of Ohio. And by the way, Ohio is sort of in the middle, a little bit to the east, like the Great Lakes area. Um, 
we founded it in 2003. So next year is going to be our 20th anniversary. And in those 19 years, we have now freed 34 Ohioans who together served 675 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. Uh, when I get home next week, we have another person who's going to be freed who spent about 30 years in prison. And the cases, even though we've been doing this for 19 years, it's not going away. It's only speeding up. And our rate of exoneration continues to increase. As part of this movement nationally, there have been now 3,000 people in the United States in the last 25 years proven innocent and exonerated who together spent over 27,000 years in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And I can tell you that these 3,000 people in this 27,000 years is just the tip of the iceberg. As somebody who's been doing this for 20 years, the vast majority of the cases simply can't be reinvestigated because too much time has passed. The witnesses are dead. The evidence has been destroyed. And it's only a lucky subset of people where we can actually find the witnesses. We can test the DNA. Um, who can make it through all those hurdles and all those coincidences to finally be proven innocent. And that 3,000, that 27,000 years comes out of that small subset. Ricky's case, I think, gives us a good um, illustration of how innocence projects work. So I'll, I'll turn to that now that I'm going to bring Ricky up. It was 1975 in Cleveland, Ohio. Ricky had just turned 18 years old. And he lived in a predominantly black, poor neighborhood in Cleveland. And a white businessman was gunned down and killed on the street after coming out of a little bodega, a little convenience store. Um, and of course, this is the 70s, so we didn't have electronic payments and all the things we do now. So his job was to go around to these different stores and pick up the money and pick up the money orders and take them to the bank. And someone knew that he would be coming out of the store with a briefcase full of money that day. And they were waiting outside the store and they tried to get the briefcase away from him and they threw acid in his face and he still would not let go of the briefcase. And so he was shot and killed. As you can imagine, when something like this happens, people hear the gunshots, people come running, um, the police show up on the scene. There's a body on the ground with a sheet over it and they are um, trying to keep the people back. And a 12 year old boy named Edward Vernon steps through the crowds of the police and tells the police that he was there that he saw the whole thing and he names Ricky Jackson and Ricky Jackson's two best friends, the Bridgman brothers, Wiley and Ronnie as the culprits. So the police focused on this one witness and continued to work on him for the next couple of days, had him eventually identify Ricky and the Bridgman brothers in live lineups. And the state of Ohio brought charges against Ricky and the Bridgman brothers, got a conviction and got the death penalty against all three of them based on the testimony of this 12-year-old boy at the time of the crime, 13-year-old at the time he testified, based solely on his testimony. It was an all-white jury, and they convicted and sent all of them to death row. An important piece of the story to understand is that um, in the late 70s, the U.S. Supreme Court held Ohio's death penalty statute unconstitutional. And at that time, everyone on Ohio's death row got automatically moved to life in prison. Later, Ohio enacted a new death penalty statute so they could start instituting the death penalty again. But everyone up to that time got moved over to life in prison permanently. And at that time, when that happened, one of the Bridgman brothers was seven days from his execution date. Another was 10 days from his execution date. And Ricky was a couple of months from his execution date. If not for pure luck, all three of them would have been executed back in the 1970s. So they are then moved to life in prison where they spend time, and Ricky will tell you, writing letters to everybody they can and yelling and screaming, we are innocent um, and we were wrongfully convicted, but they fall on deaf ears. We got involved in the case in about 2011. And our first instinct was to look for the evidence to try to find that cup that the perpetrator was holding that threw the, the acid to do DNA testing. And we found that the, the, all the evidence had been destroyed. It was no longer available. So the only other thing we could possibly do is talk to Ed Vernon, the 12 year old boy, 13 year old at the time he testified, now a man in his fifties because almost 40 years had passed. Um, our law students were able to track down Ed Vernon, get his current address, get his current phone number. And they called him up 
And they said, we'd like to talk to you about that case that you testified in when you were a kid. And Ed Vernon said, I saw what I saw and hung up. So that was the end. I mean, we had no other angles to go through, but we were very concerned about the case by this point. We believed Ricky and the Bridgman brothers. Um, and it was very clear that Ed Vernon had changed his story repeatedly. It was all over the place. This was a case that was raising serious red flags. So we didn't completely close the case. It just sort of went cold. A couple of years later, we get a call in our office from a pastor who says, I'm here in the hospital with a man named Ed Vernon who's dying. And he just confessed to me that when he was 12, he made up a lie that sent three innocent men to death row. And he would like to come clean. So we raced to Cleveland and we get a statement from Ed Vernon. Ed Vernon fortunately survived. Uh, he believed at the time he was dying, but he survived. And we had a recantation. So we had the state's main witness now recanting. In the U.S. and in other countries, when a witness recants many years after trial, it's usually not enough to reopen the case because the courts will be very suspicious of it. They'll say, oh, the defendant's family paid him to recant or they threatened him to get him to recant. You know, was he telling the truth then? Is he telling the truth now? But we thought that this case had a chance because of the way the recantation happened. We had a pastor, a very credible person who would be able to come and corroborate the recantation and talk to the court about how it happened when Ed Vernon believed he was on his deathbed. So we went forward and we tried to get the convictions overturned based on this recantation. And just to show you the level of investigation our students engage in, when Ed Vernon recanted, he said, I was actually on a school bus on my way home from school with other kids. And we were a couple of blocks away when we heard the shots. And at the next stop, we all got off the bus and ran down there. So our students were able to go to the school, pull the yearbook from his grade, copy all the names of everybody, and we were able to track down other people who were on the school bus who could verify that Ed Vernon was on the school bus with them and that they knew all the time that Ed Vernon was lying. Now, this is a white businessman who was killed in a black neighborhood. We had white police officers, and they told us we were afraid to come forward and interfere. We knew he was lying. Our parents told us to shut up. That's what you did back in 1975 when something like this happened in a black neighborhood in, in Cleveland. Um, but we were able to go to court in November of 2014 and present the testimony of Ricky Jackson. Ed Vernon recanted on the stand, and he told about how this was a lie from the pits of hell that had ruined his life, absolutely ruined his life. And he gave a long, compelling testimony about how the, actually the police had coerced him. He had tried to change his testimony. He was 12 years old. He wanted some attention. He made this statement. But within the next day, he told the police, I actually made it up. And they started yelling at him and screaming at him and making him stick to his story. And what he did ended up completely ruining his life. And then we were able to also present the testimony of corroborating witnesses who said, yes, I was on the bus with Ed Vernon. None of us saw it. We were several blocks away. And with that, we were able to overturn Ricky's conviction and the Bridgman brothers. When Ricky walked out of prison in November of 2014, after 39 years, he set the record for the longest serving person in US history to be exonerated 39 years. Since that time, our project in Ohio has exonerated someone who spent 46 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, I'm gonna bring Ricky up um, and I'm gonna start off asking Ricky some questions and we're just gonna have a dialogue. Um, but the first thing is, please talk to them about Ed Vernon, what you thought of him in prison and your journey with forgiveness. Uh, before I answer that question, I would first of all like to thank our hosts and especially Ian, who's navigated me through, through all of this. Uh, I'm sorry if I don't remember everybody's name, but everybody who helped me and my family along this journey since we've been in this beautiful country, thank you so much. The hospitality has been outstanding. Um, when we were in prison, um, there was so much we didn't know about our case and why we were actually in prison. We knew that we were charged with capital murder. I had spent two and a half years of my life on death row, coming perilously close to being executed. And um, after we were released from death row and given a life sentence, um, all I could think about was how much I hated Ed Vernon. And he was the poster child for all my anxiety, uh, my hatred, my loathing. Um, but 
when the Ohio Innocence Project got on board, excuse me, and took over our case and started revealing some of the things that had gone on that we weren't aware of, um, I came to realize that Edward, as a 12-year-old child, was really just a pond. I mean, how much control could a 13-year-old child have over the entire criminal justice system, including the police? I mean, he was coerced and threatened pretty much like we were. And so talk about like your, your journey with him. He's in your mind. He's causing all this pain and suffering. He's your focus. Exactly. Um, he was, I mean, he was like that burden on your back that I could never get rid of. You know, I thought about him constantly. Um, honestly, thought about if I ever got out, how much I wanted to destroy and ruin his life like he had ruined mine. Um, but when I got an opportunity, uh, when I got my freedom, and I realized that he was a victim as much as we were, um, I knew it was tantamount for me to meet Edward and to let him know that um, I wanted to forgive him for what he had did. You know, I had to. Um, he had been such a part of my life for so long, for 39 years. Um, and I knew that having given this rare opportunity because in my position, guys don't get an opportunity like this often. And um, I knew that I didn't want to live whatever life I had left on the outside, being worried and hating Edward Vernon. And so um, I arranged through my lawyer, Brian Howe, to meet with Edward. Matter of fact, at this same pastor's church who took his confession, and um, we met and we sat down and um, we talked for about 15 minutes. And um, I could see he was afraid of me at first. I don't know if he thought I was going to try to harm him physically, but really, I just wanted to meet him and let him know because I had to do this. It was more so for myself than him. You know, um, I knew that if I didn't do this, that I would always be in that state of mind of hatred, loathing. And just, you know, I just had to release him. And the only way I could release him was to forgive him. And so we sat down and talked. And when it was time to go, we sat, we stood up and embraced. And um, I just felt this sense of such utter relief. And I felt it in him too. I felt his body grow light in my arms. And I knew that that was the, sig the signal for me to start my new life anew. Without all this baggage that I'd carried for 39 years about this case, about my life. And um, at the end of our conversation, I told him with all sincerity, I hope whatever years you have left on this earth are good and that you're going to have a good life because I intend to. I can't carry you with me anymore. And um, I kept my promise to myself. Since then, I've had a great life. Um, I've been able to do stuff like this, um, come to your beautiful country. I met friends all over the country, uh, my country, all over the world, as a matter of fact. And um, that wouldn't have been possible if I had been a revengeful, hateful person. You know? How about Clarissa? Would you have been able to? No, my wife. I mean, nobody would want to be bothered with me because I had so much pent up anger um, about what had happened to me, about my life and how I felt my life had been destroyed. But my life was actually just put on hold. It wasn't destroyed. And um, I wouldn't have been able to do what I do now and have the kind of life that I live now if I did not forgive him, you know? So, but it wasn't only solely for him, it was mostly for myself, you know? And more than anything, that helped me to heal, the healing process to move on a little faster. So, I want to tell you about the the hearing. This is November of 2014. This is when we're going to court and we're going to present the evidence that Ricky's innocent, that Ed Vernon lied. And it's basically like a trial. And it was to start on a Monday. Oh, thank you so much. It was to start on a Monday. And we had a judge that we thought was a favorable judge, open-minded judge that might actually rule in our favor. But we thought the chances were 50-50. The, the it's very hard to win these cases in court. Um, but we also knew the judge was had already retired and he was leaving the bench in a couple months. And the judge that was taking his place was going to be very, very bad for us. Um, it was somebody from the prosecutor's office. And so we showed up for our first um, day in court. And the prosecutor said, we have a deal for you. 
We will drop the charges right now if Ricky agrees to plead guilty to the same charges and we'll agree that he can be sentenced to time served and he can walk free right now. And the judge looked at us and said, you have to decide, you got five minutes because if this trial doesn't start on time, I'm kicking it to the next judge. And so we had to go to Ricky. He was in the holding room. He was shackled at the legs and shackled at the arms and say, we, I really hate to put you in this position. You got five minutes. Do you can plead guilty and say you did it and walk free right now? Or we can roll the dice and go through this trial and we put our odds at 50-50. If we lose, you're going to spend the rest of your life in prison. Tell them what you were thinking at that time. Uh, at the time that you guys were telling me this, it seemed like you said I only have five minutes, but it seemed like five hours. And honestly, um, after having served 39 years in prison, having lost so much, having lost my mom, um, my family shattered. Um, it was so tempting. I mean, and that carrot was right there. You know, it was so tempting. I can leave this prison. I can leave this hell today. But I thought about all that I had been through, all that I had sacrificed. Um, and I said, no, I'm Mark. I don't need five minutes. Um, whatever happens, happens. I'm, I can't live my life as a convicted murderer. I just couldn't. You know, that was like being dishonest to myself and uh, living my life as a lie, I couldn't do it. And so I told him, man, let's go out there and roll the dice, whatever happens, happens, but I'm gonna die with the truth on my side. And that's what my position in that, in that decision. We ended up winning, he was freed Friday at the end of the trial. Um, and we told him 50-50, we didn't know. Talk about, um, you mentioned your mother, how she inspired you in prison to stay sane. Um, Her words were to you. Before she passed away, she told me, um, I know things look bleak right now, um, but you got to promise me that you will not let these people make you a prisoner. You're not a prisoner. You've been captured. You've been captured. You're not a prisoner. Uh, you didn't commit a crime. And I need you to be Ricky Jackson when you get out, only better. Do not become a prisoner. Do not succumb to that prison number. Remember who you are and remember what I taught you. And um, I'm sorry. Um, and that was just one of the things that always stuck with me. And um, I just took that and I ran with it. I started educating myself. I started reading books. Um, I kept away from the prison rigmarole, the clamor of prison that guys get so easily sucked into, especially if you're doing a long time in prison. You learn to become a prisoner. And uh, I kept hearing those words from my mother. Don't let these people turn you into a prisoner, you know? And um, that's what I strove to do. Um, I read a lot. Um, I started a lot of prison programs. Uh, I brought the Red Cross into prison. I taught guys how to do CPR. And uh, my main goal and focus was to just keep moving forward, just to keep building on myself and being better and preparing myself to be free, even though I knew it was a possibility that I might not ever be free. But I was always getting up every day, preparing for that day when I might be free. When Ricky first got out, he was invited to give a TED talk at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, probably the most prestigious place in America you can give a TED talk. And they brought him up for a few days beforehand to um, practice and meet everyone. And the curator called me on the second day he was there and said, we gave him a tour yesterday. And I've done the same thing with Nobel Prize winners who have given and former US presidents who have given TED Talks. And Ricky Jackson knew more about the art in this museum than any person I've ever met. Um, talk about how that how you got to that. Well, a little backstory, if I may. Um, even before all this happened in my life, when I was a young kid, um, I used to go to the Cleveland Museum of Art and I was always impressed by this big white building with these big stone columns and um, there was a statue of the thinker outside the, the museum. And I was always fascinated by what's going on in there. Why do so many people go in there every day? And so one day I got up my courage and uh, there was this troop of school children, white school children going in. They were lined up about to go into the museum on a tour. So I just fell in line behind them. I was the only black kid in line. 
and I just walked in. I didn't even have a school uniform on. <laughs> I walked in and the security guard looked at me and he's like, whatever. And um, from that moment on, I was fascinated and I fell in love with art because I had never been exposed to anything like that. And um, they had this cavalry horseman, armored horseman at the entrance of the museum. And um, I was a wee tyke at the time and this thing seemed so human humongously big. And I was so pressed. It was my best, my favorite piece in the whole museum. And um, fast forward, when I was released from prison, the museum offered to give me a tour of the museum. It had been re revitalized and everything. Um, a lot of stuff had been moved around, but I was looking forward to seeing this cavalry horseman. And um, to my dismay, when we got to the museum, it was gone. And so I was kind of downtrodden about that. And I pretended like I was really interested in the rest of the tour. But my favorite piece had been, it was gone. And But they were really playing a joke on me. They had moved to another location. And they were taking me all around the other ways until we finally got to this room. And when I stepped around the corner, that was my guy. I was a little taller now, and he seemed not as big then, but it was just a great surprise. And um, that moment, it connected me with my past, you know. And um, But while I was in prison, um, I had a great love for art and the history of art and the people that created this art. And so I did a lot of reading. Um, nobody in the ever took art books out of the library. So I had pretty much all of them in my safe, <laughs> you know, and um, I would just sit, look at these pictures and read about the artists and the times and the, and the events that caused these people to create. And it was, to me, it was magical to know that people had this capability to create such beauty and how it lasted and how we were the proprietors of this art and it was our job to take care of it. And so um, that's why I gained my knowledge of art, you know, what limited knowledge I have, I should say. But um, art has always been a big part of my life. We only have a few minutes and then we're going to do Q&A, right? Um, there's a couple of interesting things I want to make sure you hear from him. Talk about the sensory overload on the day you walked free and like the differences between prison and then the real world. I think uh, that's interesting for people to hear. I don't know if you anybody's familiar with the movie Groundhog Day. Well, uh, Chevy Chase relives the same day. That's pretty much what prison is like, especially if you're doing decades. Every day is the same. You know, you can pretty much blindfold yourself and get through your day without a hitch. And that's how prison is. The same colors, the same sounds, the same smells, the same orders every day. Not even even the shades he's saying, you like know. you only see certain shades of orange, right? Exactly. Like for 39 years. The colors are the same. And so all of a sudden the judge says, you're free to go. And I step out onto the courtroom steps outside for the first time as a free man in 39 years. And we were downtown Cleveland in the middle of the day there's traffic, there's gasoline smells, there's cars honking. Everybody's got on a different color. You know, they're not marching in line. And just the sensory overload was so great. I just stood there numbed and I felt like I was having an out of body experience. You know, the, the sensory overload was just that tremendous. And I stood there and everybody was asking me, are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? And I didn't answer because I wasn't there at that time, you know, I was just floating around looking at it because it was so surreal to believe that I had survived that nightmare and uh, was standing there. And um, it was such a tremendous feeling, but I could honestly, I could not move. I was so overloaded. You know, my senses were so overloaded with the sudden change of my world. We ready now? One more. Um, so I, Talk about the first couple of weeks. You know, we put you up. We had we got him a little efficiency. We had a donor. After 39 years, you don't even have an ID, right? It's like you can't even go get a driver's license. Um, sort of what your first reactions were and um, the moment you sort of realized you were free. Um, that first night alone by myself, um, I didn't sleep for five days straight, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, I was up 24-7. I was so geeked up with adrenaline, I couldn't sleep. And uh, when I finally got a chance and the opportunity to be by myself, um, I just sat there. They dropped me off in my little efficiency apartment. And I just, I didn't even take my coat off. I just sat on the bed like, okay, what do I do now? 
And um, it occurred to me, like, you know, you can just get up and go where you want to go now. And so that's what I did. I opened my front door. I walked out of my apartment and it was a crisp, cold November night. The moon was full. And um, I think at that moment, at that moment, I really felt free for the first time being able to come and go as I wanted to. And, um, but there was still this, I kept expecting somebody to say, where are you going? Uh, you're out of place. But that, sen that sensation soon wore off. And um, I, like I said, that was the first moment, the first time I really felt that I was totally free. Can you tell them, I want one more quick thing. Can you tell them who lovely Rose Jackson is? Lovely Rose um, is my daughter. She's two, about to be two. Um, it's my first child. I'm an old dad. <laughs> But she keeps me young because she's all over the place. Um, but that's my baby. I have three stepchildren also by my wife, from my with my wife. Um, I'm a family guy. You know, I love being a family man. Uh, I always wanted to be a family man. And, you know, it's funny because I used to have this dream when I was in prison um, about being a dad. And um, during my pre-sentencing, they give you this test to see if you're sane enough to be executed. And um, during this test, they had me draw a picture. And I drew a picture of a house with a fence around it. And um, this is so weird, but the house I ended up buying resembled so much that drawing back in the 1970s that I drew when they were trying to execute me. It was just uncanny and remarkable. Um, but I have a great life and I don't want anybody to feel sorry for me. Um, if I knew the outcome was going to be this, I would gladly do it all over again. I really would. Um, I have my beautiful daughter, my beautiful wife, my beautiful family. I have a nice home and it's not just the material stuff, but it's the people I've been able to meet and the friends I've been made, able to make along this journey that has made it all worthwhile. So thank you guys very much. Ricky Jackson and Mark Godsey of the Freedom Project, Ohio. You know, every week I tell you there's a video recording of all of our talks, but I urge you not to miss this one. You can find it at our website, john-adams.nl slash videos. There's also a long Q&A with the audience that adds even more depth to this incredible story. We also have a fantastic newsletter you can sign up for and more podcasts and videos and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member of the John Adams? Not only will you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, go to wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review. This will help get the word out and we can keep on sharing this, the very best of American thinkers and speakers with you, free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz from Amsterdam. This was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Gruber. Thank you for listening.